Washington and I was explaining to him that PAFI is a forum of public affairs professionals. We are just not the voice of our companies to the external stakeholders, but we also bring in a lot of outside in perspective within our companies. We have conversations which are sometimes difficult, but necessary to have to make sure that there is some amount of confluence between all our st uh, external stakeholders and within our company. And therefore, PAPI is just not a platform for advocacy. It is also a platform for ideation, contestations, debate, disagreement sometimes, and deliberations. And obviously, annual lecture was just a natural sort of an event for us to have because in the beginning of the year, probably in the second, third week of January, this will be a good idea for us to start the, the dialogue and the deliberations for the rest of the year. Now, when the management committee and some of us were actually discussing about the annual lecture and we were looking at who should we invite to really kickstart our very first annual lecture of PAFI. And the first name that cropped up in that conversation was that of Nandan. And then we didn't go to anybody else. We thought, I mean, we have probably, you know, hit the bullseyes right at the beginning. And why, why Nandan should be the first person to really kick off this annual lecture? You know, I mean, some of us are very, have a lot of blessings and privileges in our life not because what we are endowed with, but it's also what we make of. And Nandan has showed that what can be done in one lifetime. It, you know, there was a time when it was a saying about education that education is not about filling the bucket, it was lighting the fire. I think Nandan is one such person who personifies this. He's lit fires which, whose enduring flames will probably provide warmth for generations of Indian to come. In today's world that is so fragmented and doing something which is connected through technology in today's world the empowerment through identity as the founding chairman of the unique identification authority of india what nandan has accomplished for over a billion plus indian is extraordinary uh, most recently he's co-founded and he's the chairman of a non-profit not-for-profit called ek step which is essentially to create a learner-centric technology-based platform to improve the basic literacy of millions of Indian children. In 2006, he was awarded the Padma Bhushan. If, if I start giving you the num number of accolades that Nandan has received in his life, probably this lecture will finish at that. I mean, it will be more than an hour to do that. Uh, Nandan has also authored a, a, a wonderful book, Imagining India, and co-authored a second book with Viral Shah. Rebooting India, realizing the billion aspiration. So thank you very much, Nandan, to, to have agreed to do this annual lecture with us. But before I hand over the uh, uh, proceedings to you, I also wanted to acknowledge and thank our, thank our friend Aman Jain from Google and Google for supporting this event. So without any further ado, over to you, Nandan. We are all eager to hear from you. And let's hope that we, we, we make it very, very interactive. The flow of the session is that Nandan is going to speak for a while and we encourage all our members and all participants to type in their questions and send it to us. We will try and accommodate as many questions as possible. And let's let's start. So over to you, Nandan. Thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you, Ishtiak. And uh, it's really a great uh, pleasure for me to be speaking to all of you at the Public Affairs Forum of India and many of the people who are there in this forum at the leadership are old friends of mine. So it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, and I thank you for this opportunity because in some sense, you gave me a chance to look at what all I've done and try to see you know, whether there's a sort of a framing of how to think about policy. And so I've tried to put together my thoughts uh, for this occasion based on my experience and, and all of you. Now, I've had an interesting career. I've, I've meandered a bit here and there. So I've been uh, a business leader uh, at Infosys. I'm currently the chairman prior. I was earlier there for a very long time. I have worked in the government, in the cabinet rank to do the UIDI project. I worked with the government from outside on different uh, policy and technology issues. And I've led an NGO, which is trying to do something uh, on a large scale. So I have sort of, a, I've been able to come at this issue from different angles. Uh, and that I think uh, will help, has helped me to get a perspective of the policy and, and how to deal with it. 
It's also the what I'm going to talk about spans 30 years because my first uh, encounter, so to speak, with policy was in way back in 1991, and 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 you know, uh, so it gives you a over a time. And when I talk about policy, I think you also alluded to Ishtia, which is that it's about what can we do to make the country a better place. You know, it. it it's about how will this advance the country? How will it create more jobs? How will it uh, give a better future for young people? How do we make sure that we have a safety net for the vulnerable? So I always approach policy as things that have positive network effects, positive externalities. Uh, and all the work I've done on policy, whether it's from the private sector or as a government person or from an NGO, I've been from the angle of how does policy make the country better? And I think that's a very important thing in policy. Policy is not lobbying. Policy is about figuring out what's good for the country and then making sure you articulate that and make it effective. To me, the first example of this very successful thing was actually way back in 1991. And if you don't mind, I'll go back a bit. And that was the early years of the software industry. Uh, and sometime in 1988, NASCOM had been set up as a policy advocacy group for the software industry. And one of the reasons for its setup was actually that the earlier technology association was not representing the software interests. So one thing you realize is that you know often you create associations and groups because the existing ones don't articulate what you feel. And there was a possibility of a huge opportunity in, in software exports and so on. And this was something which became apparent in 1991 we had 1991 out of that time when we had liberalization, we had economic reforms, we had technology, earth stations were possible to do remote development and so on. And, the NASCOM, and I was one of the co-founders of NASCOM in those days. And they, they we, NASCOM worked very closely with the government. And that time we had a fantastic secretary called Mr. N. Whittle, who was the secretary for the Department of Electronics. And a lot of the policy framework which led to the accelerated growth of the technology industry was laid at that time. Those included liberalization of software technology parts, tax, tax breaks, importing equipment of the latest type, setting up earth stations. And that was possible because the industry came together and said, here's something which is going to create millions of jobs. <clears throat> here's something that can earn a huge amount of foreign exchange for the country. And way back in 91, 90, foreign exchange, remember, was a big issue, gold uh, to Bank of England and all that. And I think government also realized the value of this. And today, thanks to that concerted effort in policy making, today we have an industry which has $191 billion of revenue, uh, employing a few million people, uh, and really impacting the world through technology. So that's a great example of how a policy which was brought together by uh, industry coming together, working with government in a very trusted manner, because the government trusted the industry to do the right thing, today has become one flagship industry for India and one of the biggest foreign exchange earners to the extent that our software uh, surpluses are contributing to our current account surplus. So I think that is a good example of policy. And, and the policy is not just about what's in the file it's about for example one of the policies of that time was the creation of earth stations and the earth stations were set up the government set up a new body called software technology park of india and that then set up a series of earth stations and that led to small companies being able to export software sitting in india so all these things made a huge impact on the way that uh, things happened another example of uh, policy work which i was involved with was on urbanization uh, you know, uh, in about 2001 or so, I mean, in the early part of the century, I, I worked on something called the Bangalore Agenda Task Force. And uh, I worked on, uh, uh, on the city of Bangalore and how to make it better. And I learned a lot of the issues to do with urbanization. And in 2004, when that the first UPA1 came into power, we presented some of those ideas to the government saying how cities can be improved upon. And many of those ideas became part of the Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission. And it's important because till then, cities in India had not been given, uh, you know, the right importance. You know, the whole per perception was that uh, it was more in the villages and cities can take care of themselves. I think that was the first time that cities started getting importance in the scheme of things. 
And today, after 15 years, cities have become central to India's growth, India's economic vitality. Then again, I think many of the ideas and policies on urbanization that we had proposed uh, you know, were helpful. So that again shows that if you're able to bring a good set of ideas to the table, you can actually change the uh, direction of, of things. But I guess my biggest experience with policy was with Aadhaar. Uh, I, I, I was given the job in 09 to give an identity to everyone. And while it was a technology project, it was also a huge policy advocacy project, which is sometimes not fully uh, appreciated because people see it as an extremely high tech product. But actually, the bigger job was for me was advocacy. And when this project started in uh, July 2009, it took us 14 months to build the tech platform. And in 14 months, I went and visited every state in the country. I would go to Raipur and, you know, I, I went to Tiruvanthapuram, I went to Assam, Gauhati, I went everywhere. I went to Patna, I met the chief ministers, I met the chief secretaries, told them about this ID project and how it would benefit the state, how it would help them to deliver benefits better. And then I, I, I talked the same story to the parliament, I did it to journalists, to activists, to lawyers, to external agencies, the world, everyone. And I realized that if you want to bring a huge change in a country, you can't just do something. You have to articulate a change and make it available, make it widely known. And that, that evangelization and that advocacy which I did helped to actually deal with a lot of the challenges that we faced. So when the thing was actually rolled out 14 months later, it was very easy to scale it up. And as you know, at the time I quit government in 2014, 600 million people had been issued the Aadhaar number. And today it's about 1.27 billion people. And I also learned that how to deal with political uncertainty, because you know the project was started uh, at the time of the UPA government and has been continued with renewed vigor in the, in the the Modi government. So fundamentally, you know, a lot of policy is also about how do you make sure that you get bipartisan support across political lines so that different states and different political persuasions all put, your, put their weight behind policy. So that ensures that policy remains, uh, uh, you know, re remains consistent. Otherwise, if policy becomes a political football, then every time there's a change in, in government, then the policy can be reversed. So I think it's very important when you think of policy, how do we make sure that we have broad spectrum of support uh, for the policies that matter? It's also important to realize that policy is a marathon game. It's not a sprint. And sometimes it takes years and years for policies to mature. And I'm sure you, all of you have gone through it. But if you do the right thing, then sooner or later, the policies which have uh, value for society, value for the people will emerge and will become uh, you know, valid. Uh, an example of this is uh, in 2010, when I was uh, at that time a uh, chairman of UIDAI, uh, I was asked by the, trans the road transport minister of that time, Mr. Kamal Nath, saying, how do we just make, simplify the collection of tolls on, on our highways? Because you know, in those days, every day, a different vendor would land up there and say, use my technology. And so I headed a committee which came out with the idea of having an RFID tag based system. This is in 2010, you know, 11 years back. And uh, for a long time, that report was there. It, it laid the complete framework of how to use RFID tags, how to make digital pay, how to make payments from accounts, how to uh, let you know, trucks and cars go through highways without stopping and so on. The good news is that today that has become the de facto way of our roads. And the fast tag uh, project uh, endorsed by our minister, Mr. Gadkari, has become a great success. Now, everyone is able to go on highways. They don't have to stop. They automatically debit the account. And the other good thing about this has been the increase in the revenues of the toll, the toll collections at highways, because now all, all the tolls are happening digitally, digital payments. And that in turn makes investment in tolls more viable because you, you know you have a recovery of the investment. So this again shows that something which you conceived of 10, 11 years back today has become so mainstream. So policy is something which you have to uh, be patient about. You must articulate it. You must put your weight behind it. And very often you 
you are not able to get the policy that that you want and that becomes very, very important another very important aspect about policy is being prepared with what you know whatever policies that you have in mind because events lead to policies that's it's very important to realize that events lead to policies and i'll give you three general examples and then i'll talk to one example for example is that the whole uh, disaster management act of 2005 actually came out because of the tsunami of 2004 in other words there was a massive tsunami if you remember in tamil nadu and a lot of people died and that essentially the government created the disaster management act of 2005 and set up the ndma and later on the same act was used for the pandemic so but it was the it was the fact that the tsunami happened that led to this act similarly uh, the 2611 incident in mumbai the horrific terror attack led to the formation of the nia as well as the unlawful activities uh, uh, prevention act so both these laws came about as a consequence of 2611 and the third example of course is the nirbhaya case in delhi which uh, which was a horrific rape case which then led to the nirbhaya act uh, on 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 matters of sexual assault so what the point i'm making is that the policy is a consequence of an event happening and uh, therefore uh, it's important that we recognize that events lead to policies and but also if if, the, if a particular event happens it also creates what what is called as a policy window you know you know the, the idea of a policy window is that uh, there is a problem there is a po possible solution and there is for because of some event there is the political will or political appetite to do the solution you know so it, you know all these three comes together to form what's called as a policy window uh, and uh, i encountered this in my work on uh, a benefit transfer and subsidy reform and it was a very unusual thing because sometime exactly 10 years back on january 25th 2011 an additional collector in nasik district was burned to death by the kerosene mafia and that led to an outbreak of outrage at this later on of course there were, when the people did the investigation they found more complexities the notion that a bureaucrat was burned to death by the so called kerosene mafia created a huge outcry to reform our uh, subsidy and direct cash transfer and at that time mr pranab mukherjee was the finance minister and he asked me to lead a, a group to come up with a reform structure and that that whole effort led to the formation of the aadhar based direct cash transfer direct direct benefit transfer which was applied for example to energy reform uh, and allowed uh, you know lpg to be sold at market price so the cash transfer was done kerosene could be sold at market price it also allowed things like pensions and scholarships to be electronically debited credited to the account but that single incident of one a person being burned to death so badly horrifically by the so called kerosene mafia gave the political impetus to reform this area saying that we can't have this anymore and this infrastructure of dbt came in extremely handy in the in, in the case of uh, the covid crisis because you uh, the government is able to transfer uh, to millions of people emergency uh, money using uh, instant credit to the bank account so that again you know so how you can see a policy happens some event happens and so on and we saw this with digital payments in india digital payments in india actually there have been two events which have accelerated digital payments uh, just to uh, move back a bit way back in 2015 or earlier uh, the national payment corporation of india set up a group to look at next generation payments i was involved with that as the as the innovation advisor and came up with a payment system called upi which is a very advanced payment system and that payment system was even possible because of npci because rbi which was a regulator was very supportive of having a new payment system uh, and uh, the governor was very supportive and this payment system was launched in may of 2016 but there was not much traction because people are not using it but in october of 2016 it was doing barely 
100,000 transactions a, a month. And today this system does 2.3 billion transactions a month. Because there were two events which, which accelerated digital payments. One was, of course, the Demon event in November 2016. And because of Demon, suddenly there was a realization that we needed to have an alternate way of payment apart from cash. And remarkable, in the three months, there were so many major policy decisions taken to accelerate digital payments. And that led to a huge rise in digital payments. And then COVID came along. And in COVID, again, we people realized that they would like to do more contactless digital payments. So two events, one, the demon, and second, COVID, actually both led to the acceleration of digital payments. But the policy window was that the government had to move quickly to make digital payments work on both occasions. And so a lot of the policy changes happened during those times. But many of those policy changes were actually had already been conceptualized, but they got traction because of the event. So I think the message in all that is that you have to be patient. You have to think about various policy changes and make sure that they're there uh, in, 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 your, uh, uh, in, in the system and, and make sure that you take it forward. Again, another good example of a policy change for the business side is working from home. You know, for many years we have had uh, software technology parks and software, you know, SEZs, special economic zones. And the fundamental rule in both these was that you work inside a physical area. So you have a software technology park, SEZ, it's a bonded kind of place, all the computers are inside, people come there and work, and that was software export. But the, uh, the whole COVID changed this rule dramatically, and again, the government moved at lightning speed and allowed work from home to be considered for software export and actually allowed computers that were in campuses to be moved to people's homes so that they could work from there. This is a great act of good faith by the government saying that we want the industry to continue and we will no longer have the old restrictions of the computer having to be inside the ACZ. It, you could use it from home. And now having learned about work from home, now the thinking is, can this become a permanent way of doing things so that you have more flexibility? So again, COVID, which was another act of God kind of event, led to the policy changes that led to uh, the uh, work from home and changing the whole concept of uh, software technology parks, bonded warehouses, ACs, heads, all that went, you know, was completely turned uh, away because of the of the need for for doing this. So I think. Uh, this is the other important thing in policy, which is the, which I mentioned briefly in the beginning, which is coalition building. You know, policy, first of all, as I said, your intent should be good. Your intent should be a policy which is in the public interest, a policy which will expand the market, create more jobs, help the country grow, and so on. And it should be a policy which, uh, which has many beneficiaries and therefore, you have to create a coalition of those potential beneficiaries. Because if you want to bring change through policy, then many people must believe in that change. It's not just you, you, your company, or even the association that you represent. You must look at a larger coalition and find other stakeholders who have an interest uh, in that policy if you really want to make it successful. Because I have found that people are very open-minded if you are able to put forth a policy which is beneficial to the country, and if able to articulate its benefits, then they're willing to go along. And therefore, building coalitions, evangelization, creating a network of allies who believe in it is very, very important. Now, at this point, let me talk about two things which have a policy things which I think need to be done. And here again, I think we all need to work together. The first is how do we revive the economy and how do we get small business to, to do better? And a very important thing which has been done is the idea of creating a digital lending platform for the country. And you know the Reserve Bank of India has done something called account aggregator, which allows companies to use the data from their business transactions and use that to get credit. And the difference is that unlike 
previous credit, which was based on uh, asset based, this is flow based, this is based on your invoices, and this is based on your business. And this will be hugely beneficial for, 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 for uh, small business. And I think it's very important that we all work together uh, to make sure that this policy is implemented and we create a new cycle of credit for small business and that will play a huge role in reviving the economy. And I think that's something which uh, all of you as public affairs advocates should look at. The second thing is how do we accelerate the vaccination of the country? This again is very important for everybody because the sooner we are able to uh, accelerate vaccination, uh, the sooner we'll be able to come out of the COVID situation and the sooner that the economy can be revived and people can get jobs and, and, and society can start functioning in, the, in the, pre the way it used to. Now, in my view, if we have to vaccinate at scale, we'll have to vaccinate something like 5 to 10 million people a day uh, to make it happen. And people often think that this challenge is one of supply. And yes, today the challenge is one of supply, but in about six to nine months, the challenge will not be supply anymore because India is fortunate to be the vaccine capital of the world. And therefore we'll have many, many more vaccines that will come, which have been approved and which will be manufactured, you know, hundreds and billions of doses every month. And then the challenge will go from supply to how to get it done at scale. And this is something which will require a strong cooperation between the government and the private sector, hospitals and so on, because this is too big a task for any one person, any one organization to do. And therefore, I think there's a huge role for advocacy on how do we create the right architecture for vaccinating millions of people a day? How do we leverage the strengths of our uh, hospitals, our doctors, our nurses, our vaccinators, how do we use digital technology to make sure it's foolproof? How do we make sure that everybody gets a vaccination certificate, which then they can show when they're boarding a bus or getting a restaurant to show that they're vaccinated? There's a huge uh, uh, advocacy challenge here because I think it has to be a multi-pronged attack on vaccination. So I'm just giving you examples of current issues that the country is facing which will benefit from the right articulation of the benefits of doing it in a different way. So I think I will stop here, Ishtiak, because I think my point is that uh, policy is a long game. Policy requires you to create allies and coalitions. Uh, policies are driven by policy windows. Events play a huge role in policy, and therefore being prepared at all times is the best possible way to deal with it. And policies, if you have the right intent, if they are persuasive, to be able to demonstrate the benefits, can have immense benefits for the country and society. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Nandan. Thank you, Nandan. Sure. Uh, can everybody please go on mute? Okay. So thank you, Nandan, for that great uh, opening address. Uh, I think it is fascinating to hear your 30 years of experience. Uh, you know, a lot of things that we knew intuitively, but that you put it down uh, so, uh, you know, so eloquently. You know, the need to be patient, to have good intent in the first place, build coalition, and so on and so forth. Uh, Nandan, it has been my personal privilege to have known you for over 20 years now. And my first memory of you is uh, meeting you in that Infosys Heritage Building when uh, Tarun Das and I had come to meet you there. And I think Mr. Murthy had given something like two crores of his personal money, personal stock of, uh, of Infosys to CII to build a, uh, you know, a video conference system. Video conference. Yeah, and I was just thinking if it was now, I would have blindly recommended Cisco Telepresence. But then those days uh, we came to seek your advice. And then after the meeting, you drove us in your Ford, uh, Icon car, I think, uh, from uh, your office to MG Road. Um, now you are yourself an icon. The, po the question I'm trying to ask you is more that you have always been personally so invested in industry associations. You know, you talked about NASCOM before, but I know about your time in CII. So I wanted to ask you, how do you see the evolution of uh, associations in India? What are the role that they have been playing? Uh, 
Uh, have they become better? I mean, when I say them, I'm talking about us. Have we become better at speaking truth to, truth to authority? For example, next week we'll have the, not next week, on Monday we'll have the budget. And I'm sure most industry captains would give nine on 10 on the budget. I don't even know what the budget is about, but that is normally the trend. So how has the association evolved? What are the scope for improvement there? And uh, uh, what's your take on it, both uh, as your experience while being in the industry and while being in the government? Uh, thank you, Harish. Yes, I have a long association, of course, with NASCOM, but also with CII. And uh, I remember Ajay was there, you were there and all, and we did uh, India Everywhere at Davos in 2006, which completely changed the global uh, image of India. And there was, again, a terrific co collaboration between CII, industry, as well as the government, who all came together and gave a huge impact. And the next year we did uh, India at uh, 70 in uh, New York. So these are all, again, CII, the tourism department, and so on. So I think uh, I work closely with uh, NASCOM, CII, IAMI, I work with uh, iSpirit. So I have, I have a lot of experience actually working with different uh, uh, groups. And I think uh, definitely there's a lot that has been done, but a lot more can be done. I think as we go forward, I think we have to uh, bring in uh, policy making, which is fact based, which is evidence based, which where we're able to demonstrate through data that what we're advocating has a positive network effect on the society and so on. So I think there's definite case for uh, doing more of that, uh, which I think all the associations can do. And also, I think uh, coalition building is very important. I think uh, I think they do a good job, but you can do more of that. Because coalitions are not just about corporate leaders. Coalitions will be business leaders, could be state governments, could be, you know, enlightened politicians. I mean, it's a really, a, you have to bring a lot of people together to get something to go. And I think that's the lesson that consensus building, coalition building, and putting a lot of dis different people behind an idea is the key to its success. Thank you, Nandan. You're also one of the rare examples or even rarer example of somebody who went from industry to government laterally and made a success out of it. So talk us a little bit about your experience and uh, would you recommend that as a general principle or rule that the government should do to encourage more people to come from industry to government and, and vice versa? And do you think that will lead to better policy making by the government? No, I, I'm, I'm a believer in uh, recruiting uh, more lateral uh, folks into the government. Uh, of course, I was uh, lucky because I, I sort of came in at a pretty high level. I, I had a cabinet rank, uh, thanks to uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, who was very gracious and gave me the cabinet rank to do the other project. And uh, so sometimes it's, it's you know, government is, is a hierarchical organization. And therefore, the higher you are in the hierarchy, the more you can get done. So in that sense, it, it, it was important that I have that rank. Uh, but I think uh, more people should get in. And we have had, I think, it's, I'm not the first or the last example of a lateral entry into government. I mean, way, way before my time, you know, we had Mantos Sondi, we had Varghese uh, Kurian, we had, uh, you know, Vikram Sarabhai. I mean, there are many, many examples of people who went from outside into government and, and did a good job. So so I think uh, that trend should continue. I think it's very important because finally solving the complexities of India require diverse skills and diverse uh, experience. I think one of the things that we learn in business is the importance of demand. Because when you run a business, you know it's, it's also about creating demand and demand then can supply. Sometimes in government, it tends to be much more supply oriented and the value of demand is not fully appreciated. And therefore, I think people who have been in business and looked at demand uh, and therefore how do we create demand for a particular initiative, that becomes very, very valuable. At the same time, uh, I think uh, people in the private sector underestimate the complexity of working in government because the private sector works with so well-defined rules, profits, earnings, market share, cost cutting, and all that stuff. And 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 and, and in the government and politics is, is you know it's all over the you know it's a very complex thing, many viewpoints. So how do you navigate, navigate navigating this is not not simple. One of the big things 
I learned was how to how to navigate. Right. I see Mr. Chandrasekhar also on the call, and maybe in another day I'll ask him how is it coming from government to private sector. He, he went the other way. Yes, right. <laughs> Actually, he went the other way. <laughs> so my next question is around uh, globalization, and you and Infosys uh, are a child of uh, globalization. You even inspired Thomas Friedman to write the book uh, on the world being flat. But now we have got the whole uh, you know protectionism sweeping the world. We have our own Atmanirbhar Bharat. Uh, so. My question to you is, uh, what are your views on this trend, both in India and abroad? What are the implications uh, of that for Indian companies, which are global and multinational companies uh, that work in India? And, and, and it all leads also to the, it's a very important question for public affairs professionals, because to your point, we all try to make our companies relevant in the geographies that we operate. So uh, your views on, on globalization as you see today. No, no, I think while, of course, there is a bit of a reaction to globalization, I think for companies, it's very clear. You have to be an active local player in every market that you operate. That you need to have a strategy, an articulation, a partnership with the country, and make sure that what you do in that country reflects the priorities of that country. I think there's no doubt about that. It cannot be one size fits all from your corporate headquarters. You can't just bombard some stuff, you have to localize. I'll give an example in the case of Infosys. Uh, Infosys made a very strategic decision about three, four years back to accelerate the localization of its uh, employees. And uh, you know it, it hired 12,000 people in the US and has committed to hiring another 13,000, so 25,000 people in five, six years, which is quite becoming one of the largest job creators in the US. And that has dramatically changed, you know, uh, perceptions and the support. You know, we, we have centers in six cities, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, in, in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, in Indianapolis. And in each city, the local state government, the governor, are the biggest supporters of, of Infosys. So what that shows is that if you show, put your money where your mouth is, if you show intent to do something locally in terms of creating jobs and, and contributing to the economy, then people will welcome you anywhere in the world. So I think uh, that then the, the, the problem is if globalization is seen as a, a something which affects uh, jobs or affects uh, people's lives. If we can show that globalization is actually benefiting societies and people, then I think we'll be able to do quite well. And specifically on this uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat in India, what is your view on that? No, I, th I think, you know, uh, I think all countries are talking about increasing uh, self-reliance, but I don't think it means protectionism as such. It means having a, a strong base as well as you know, accessing global technology and global products. I mean, India today uh, is continues to be a major consumer of global technology and global products. I mean, everything there, whether it's our chips, our equipment, everything is really coming from outside, and you know, I think that is welcome. Thank you, thank you. And I've got a lot more questions, but I'm going to toss it over to uh, Ajay uh, to ask a question. Ajay, over to you. Ladnan, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. You reminded me 2004 when we were having a cup of coffee at Central Sports Hotel in Davos, and you came over and said, what is this China, China everywhere in Davos? And in 2005, you led it. We worked together. And in 12 months, in 2006, we did the campaign. So what I was trying to say, events lead to policy, but events also lead to events, which had a huge impact and which led even to Harvard to do a study on what India did in 2006 in Davos. Two short questions. Uh, when is your next book coming? You've done two. So every seven years you come up with a book. So when is the next one coming and what? And second, when do you when do we see you back in Delhi? <laughs> Well, right now, I'm, no, I, I don't think for some time. Well, you know, actually, I'm on a third book, and it's very different because the first two were big picture policy books. Uh, this one is more about, it's called The Art of Bitfulness, how to remain sane in, in the internet world. Because, you know, uh, you know, people, I think, are using the internet, are so obsessed with some social media, fake news, polarization, this, that, and the other, that I'm a strong believer in technology for good. But I'm not happy with the way it's sort of uh, evolving. So basically, it's just a book of how to how to be sane in this digital world. So it's coming out uh, this year, uh, Ajay. 
I have a co-author, Tanuj Bhojwani, who's hard at work, and I'm reviewing it with him every few days. And when we are coming to Delhi, is the next follow-up question, sir. <laughs> no, Delhi for visiting or Delhi for what? <laughs> So no, we we need people like you back in the government, sir. No, I think you know. To to be fair, uh, you know the uh, government has been very receptive whenever I have suggested something. So you know, I think uh, I don't need to be in the system. And you know, whenever I've made a good suggestion or, or what I think is a good suggestion, and they think is good, they have been willing to accept it. But, so once you have that kind of open mindedness, you don't really need to be physically there. Right. And then as you were talking, I was thinking you already had a subject for the fourth book again on policy. I think you can write a textbook on policy for, and that could be a curriculum on a serious note. I think this lecture, I think we're going to put it in our website for a lot of people to see who are not seeing sure, it. Today. Yeah. And maybe you can even make a text of that. Uh, sure, Ishtiak, sure. you had a question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Harish. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I mean, this this is related to your next book, Nandan. I mean, uh, we talked about software policies and, and and let's talk about the internet a little bit just uh, you know i mean this is ag again like the ict industry in some way remain unregulated for a very long time and then all of a sudden it's really becoming the center of our conversation now and the tendency for the governments is to actually typically go from no regulation to all regulation that you can't even breathe you know and where do you really see this panning out? Because, you know, I mean, now that all these new laws that are coming in and with all these social media and big tech platform that it is all sort of leading to. So where do you really see this, you know, I mean, in some sane way uh, coming to coming to a, a balanced position? I, I don't know. I, actually, frankly, it's difficult to predict when the balance will come. See, part of the challenge is that, you know, the way the state works, the way governments work, you know, they take time to respond and react. Whereas the way the internet works, you can spread a rumor in two seconds. So the speed of the internet is completely disproportionate to the speed at which the system can respond. And also what happens is that when it's a very sophisticated te technical issue, uh, the regulator often may not even, uh, you know, understand what, what it, what's really happening. And we saw that, we saw that with the global financial crisis. We are seeing that now with the technology issues where, uh, you, know, you, you know, earlier people thought that acquisitions should be based on size, but now we're realizing that acquisition of a small strategic company can also have a big impact on the shape of the market. So I think these are all learnings, but I think now all over the world, uh, regulators are coming to grips with this uh, in the US, Europe, India, China, everywhere actually the same issues are happening. You saw what happened in China with Alipay uh, and their public issue being called off at the last minute. And now this talk about Ant becoming uh, a holding company and regulated and so on. So I think we have, a, the, you know, you had a period between 2000 and, uh, see the, the new internet, the, the sort of the smartphone driven internet began in 2007 when the iPhone was launched and then Facebook came along and so on, Android came along. So the last few years have moved at a blistering pace. And now that massive growth, for the first time we have a consumer economy where three, four billion people have smartphones. I don't think anybody anticipated what was going to happen. So I think, uh, so I think now we are, I don't know where that steady state is going to land, but it is next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of, uh, uh, jockeying on this because you know lots of big big companies and big issues are are in the middle of all this. I think Dentala has a question. RC. I was going to go for him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hi Nandan. It's great to meet with you. Uh, hey. yeah. Quite a while. Uh, and you know you I, I'm really uh, amazed when you recapitulate the number of directions from which you come at policy making. And having done it uh, from the government most of my life and briefly from the private sector, now I'm realizing some of the, um, you know, joys as well as limits of dealing with it from a not-for-profit organization perspective. Uh, so my question was, you know, you talked about uh, policy making being the result of events and give a lot of good examples. You also had uh, extensive experience 
in dealing with policy making in the context of uh, you know future changing projects like uh, aadhar and dbt and so on but i think the my question is there is a probably a different kind of policy that we need as well different class of policies uh, which is that uh, you know there's a general consensus that uh, the new emerging technologies and digital technologies can make a huge difference in a country like india but uh, you know in order to really derive that benefit uh, in areas like healthcare in areas like agriculture and uh you know so many different areas you actually need enabling policies which actually you know uh, require a vision of the future you see where the existing policies have become a roadblock and actually proactively enable that so it's not responding to an event it is building a future on the basis of some vision so that policy making to me seem perhaps a little different from some of the categories that you outlined the challenge yeah. is how do you how do you actually enable encourage and catalyze such policy making any thoughts on that no i think it's a great point uh, rc and you know i don't know how many people realize that you are the original father of technology in government <laughs> and i remember that you know you had a vision way back 10 15 years back and things like the passport project mca 21 even aadhar was conceptualized by you so i think we should all be grateful for the work that you did uh, in government now i think uh, uh, i see the thing is like this i think those of us who believe in the possible change uh, transformation we need to formulate this and keep it ready because at the end of the day events matter i mean for example if you look at what's happening in primary education today because of the covid and children not being able to uh, go to school there have been some dramatic improvements the diksha program of the ministry of education has been a extraordinary success millions of teachers are getting trained online students are getting the worksheets so i think uh, i think it's very much there similarly in health i think the national uh, digital health mission has been quite well conceptualized uh, and now uh, our common friend mr ramseva sharma has become the ceo of uh, Uh, nha so i'm very confident that he will bring his energy and ability to execute and and accelerate uh, technology and health so i'm actually now quite uh, bullish on both technology and education in education and healthcare that in the next year we'll see some transformative change because if you remember when you began a lot of them were big projects of you know like mca 21 to reform corporate corporate world and other than that you did the whole uh, passport which has been a spectacular success so i think now we're moving into and uh, those are all central government oriented things now education health in the state level so is a much more federated architecture so we have to think differently on how to execute on that absolutely i think every uh, adversity is a opportunity and i think that's what we're seeing right now in this pandemic time wish uh, you had a question uh, please go ahead Uh, thanks arish uh, thank you nandan it's been a wonderful hearing uh, you and all the ideas that you have brought in i think as public affairs professionals it is uh, certainly wonderful there just two quick questions for you one uh, you know you conceived aadhar and it has really arrived where it is today uh, where do you see that going from here do you see it playing a bigger role from from do you think that can do further things to transform india and what is it that we can really do with aadhar and two you talked about uh, this whole issue of you know uh, the new new policies that are coming in so issues like data uh, data privacy uh, you know and uh, and issues like that which which remain you know where where companies governments don't really see eye to eye uh, you know you talked about coalition building you talked about intent so from that perspective where do you see issues like data privacy and secondly on aadhar so two questions yeah there. no I, i think aadhar is is actually gaining uh, i mean it's, the good thing is it's technology when it's working fine nobody has any issues only when something goes wrong that we all wake up so the fact that it's not in the public eye actually is a good thing it means that it's all functioning behind the scenes i think the next big use of aadhar is actually in the state sectors for example uh, if we are going to transform our energy transition if we are going to go to clean energy and all that we need our distribution companies to be in good financial health and the challenge they have is uh, the subsidies they give for power and free power and so on and therefore just like the oil sector was reformed using a dbt 
I think the next big thing, which by the way, uh, the government has uh, been talking about and uh, so on, is about using DBT in power and water so that the uh, uh, you know the, 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 these things are sold at the true price and any subsidy to the poor is done by a cash transfer so that alone will have a dramatic impact on our distribution sector both water and power and that in turn will help the transition to clean energy so i think these are all areas where we have not even uh, tested the uh, sort of uh, uh, you know it's really early days and i think that you'll see that in the next uh, uh, next, next next few years on the issue of data privacy i think again you know uh, this is a contentious issue, uh, as you well know, and I think the uh, uh, in India this was not even an issue ten years back. You know, I think uh, I don't know whether in way back in when I started the other project with uh, RC's help way back in 2009. In 2010, I actually wrote a letter to the Prime Minister saying we need a data privacy law, and that time the people said, "What are you talking about? Why do we need all this?" So, but in 10 years, I think thanks to the Aadhaar case in the Supreme Court, uh, the judgment on the fundamental right to privacy, uh, the Aadhaar bill, I think there's a lot more awareness of that. And the, the challenge is always to find a balance because, you know, obviously we want to protect individuals' interests. At the same time, the big data that is getting generated has huge potential to change life for the better. So it's always about finding that balance, uh, T.S. Thank you, Nandan. Let me uh, slip in a question. Um, you know, like um, when we started PAFI, one of the things that we had uh, was to correct the perception of a public affairs professional. In the past, it used to be uh, the safari suited, briefcase carrying, pawn chewing guy. Uh, from that to a more, uh, you know, fact based uh, uh, conversation with the government. So in, in the US, of course, the lobbying is, uh, you know, regulated, there is a law around it. Uh, in India, it is a little bit open at this point in time. So what are your thoughts about that? Do you think we need some regulations around so-called lobbying or influencing in India? You know, what are the safeguards that one should have uh, in this conversation where we could have meaningful conversation? It's not, you know, like everybody in industry is bad. There's, there needs not be any fear about this suit boot, uh, you know, people. So yeah, what, yeah. What, are, what are your views on that? No, I, look, I think I think having a healthy conversation on policy is very important for any society, because uh, I think, pol uh, you know, some as somebody said, Bismarck or somebody that making policy like making sausages, you know, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So any policy, there are multiple interests, there are multiple voices, uh, there are multiple political implications, there are multiple people who are affected, there are multiple people who are benefiting. So it's a very complex world. And the final policy that comes out is the impact of all these things. So I think we should encourage a very healthy debate on policy. And I think you as professionals, your job is to put forth the best possible argument for whatever you're advocating and why it's in the strategic interest of the country. Now, lobbying, briefcase, that is a different game. I'm, I'm not talking about that. But policy making is, I think, a very healthy activity. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Tanmoy was there, I think, in TCS when they did the MCA 21 and uh, the uh, passport thing. So I think the uh, uh, so I think it's a very healthy thing. I don't, I, you certainly should regulate uh, lobbying and briefcase and all. Yeah, There's no doubt. About that. But regular policy making, I think everybody should have a voice. Yeah, not regulate ban briefcase. Yeah, sure. Uh, Tan Tanmoy, did you have uh, anything to add? Uh, I saw you in the chat. I was just uh, uh, reminiscing about uh, 1993 in Bangalore when I'd actually gone to the Infosys facility. I used to be the regional head south of Bradma and I saw Mr. Naranamurti and Nandan actually standing on a chair and replacing a bulb in their new brand new facility. At that time, I was pitching for IBM's uh, uh, Sure One, you know, POS systems for the Reebok account of. Uh, uh, Infosys that they had bagged. So my memory is going back to 1993 in Bangalore, and of course since then he's been a he's been a dear mentor for many many of the initiatives. I've had so many interactions with him during his Aadhaar days, and a true true champion of transformation. So I was very happy to hear him acknowledging that these two programs indeed brought real transformation, measurable outcomes, and a perceptible change in the experience of governance delivery. And my question to Nandan would be that, you know, whilst IT is 
for everybody to leverage, you know, one common platform where everybody takes benefit from. The thought process in government is about the fact that, you know, ego, it is, there is a lot of ego in e-governance. I did it. So therefore, we tend to kind of do it all over again, over and over again. So in India, for example, do you believe that we have an opportunity to bring in a lot more common platforms that can encompass, let's say, the municipal landscape as a common platform or a public distribution system as a common platform? What are your thoughts on bringing some leverage of IT to pan-India impact? That's my question. Well, let, let me separate the uh, ego and the federated architecture. I think, uh, I think ego is, in the sense, I think, look, uh, you know, when you are doing something and you're working in the government, uh, or even the private sector, I think getting credit is important to people. Being identified as somebody who did it is important. So I think we should not take away from that. And we, as long as the project does not suffer, we should encourage the fact that some people are being recognized for their contribution. The second issue is a little more complex that, you know, if you, uh, the, the difference is that when something is a central subject, then the decision maker is only one. For example, when you did the passport project, Tanmoy, you had only one client, which is the Ministry of External Affairs. When you did the MCA 21, you had only one client, which was the uh, 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 Ministry of Corporate Affairs. When you did income tax, or you or Infosys, anybody did income tax, there was only one client uh, in, uh, the, in uh, the CBDT. But the moment you have something which is uh, where the states, which is a concurrent subject under the constitution, like education or health, then everybody has a voice. And a great example of that is GST. GST actually is a combination of a central tax, like excise and service tax, along with the VAT tax of individual states. And I was also involved there because uh, Mr. Pranam Mukherjee wanted me to suggest how we can do this. And I realized that, you know, uh, the center will not want the states to collect the central tax. And the states well, would not be that keen to have the center collect the state tax. And that's how we came up with the idea of creating a company called the GSTM, Goods and Service Tax Network, which was jointly owned by the states and the center. So it's a very unique structure where the center owns half of it and the states own half of it. So, you know, in policy making, you also have to think, how do we do we need a new structure to solve that? And I think creating bodies which are combination of states and center where governance is done by both is a good way in areas which are not federal topics, but concurrent list of state list topics. Municipalities, for example, you can't do that. Eh? Right. Thank you, Sandhan. I think we're almost coming to the end of our time. And uh, John Chambers always used to tell me that when you end the interaction like this, the last question will have to be a very good question. Uh, so that pressure, I'm going to put it on Virat. Uh, so over to you, Virat, for the last question. So I probably failed that test, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, uh, fantastic uh, uh, discussion today. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know this is very valuable for you. Uh, and this stunning painting behind you, which my colleagues are messaging, saying it's um, this beautiful um, piece of art that you have. Um, I was going to say, I was going to ask you, you've been part of the journey where IT went from, you spoke about 91 to where it is today, you know, a world leader, easily India's sort of crowning glory in the world. And we've tried other sectors, and I've come from telecom, I said, and, you know, telecom sort of made it, fairly large to have a billion mobile users in India. Yes, yeah, so phenomenal. phenomenal. It's a world beater. You know, it's not a, it's not a joke. And it has had many ups and downs, unlike uh, IT, which has mostly had ups, you know, sort of steady rise with some issues. Do you see another sector from India over the next decade, which is, you know, literally a decade that India must capitalize on, on the manufacturing side or any other sector, where you think we would become world beaters, uh, world champions in the way the IT has become. Is there something you see that's there that a little bit of push from everybody could get us there? One or two sectors that you think we should all focus on as a country? Well, I think uh, certainly on the economic side, I think one is, of course, uh, the transformation of our retail logistics and supply chain. 
Uh, I think uh, there's a, uh, applying technology to that. I think there's a huge, huge opportunity, whether it's the rise of e-commerce or better supply chains or last mile delivery or whatever. So I think that place is ripe for transformation. Similarly, I think uh, there's a huge transformation possible in uh, credit. India, for all its challenges, has a very low uh, credit to GDP ratio. And part of, while a lot of few large companies get a lot of loans, the millions of small companies are not getting credit. And therefore, democratization of credit, again, using the digital footprints or digital of, of small companies and giving them loans based on their business performance, I think has will have a huge impact on economic growth and, and job creation. And in the social sector, we talked about it. I think the two big areas are education and health. Because we cannot deliver health and education in the classical way of having more teachers and more classrooms. We have to do it with a combination of physical and digital, uh, which, you know, my friend Chandra at Tata's has called digital. What is that, yeah? Tanmay? Digital, no? Digital. So I think that combination. So I think we need to do that. Uh, uh, and I think so. I'm, so I would say on the business side, it would be transformation of supply chain, retail, logistics on one, and new type of lending is a second. On the social side, it's health and education at scale. I'm going to ask you one more, uh, just because I have the platform and I know you to have to go. Um, and what keeps you awake at night now at this stage of your career and life? Well, I, I think it's a race against time, Virat. I think, you know, India has an advantage of the demographic dividend. We'll be the only young country in an aging world. We'll be the only young country till 2040 while China is aging. And therefore, we can be the software capital of the world. We can be the manufacturing capital. We can provide the services of the world and make sure that we have good economic growth and, you know, improve the lives of millions. But this is a race against time. We have to do all these reforms and all these things we talk about because we only have a short window before our population also starts aging. So to me, it's about a race against time. Great question. Great Thank you. Hey, thanks, Virat. You passed the test. Good questions. Thank you. And uh, Nandan, thank you very much. Personally, to, you know, I called you at short notice and you accepted this uh, invitation. We are very grateful to you. I would like to ask Shubo, our Vice President, to propose a formal vote of thanks. Shubo. So, Mr. Nilkiri, you must have realized that the Vice President and Puffy uh, uh, has nothing to say for the entire proceedings. He is supposed to keep quiet and come in only at the last moment for this pleasant job uh, of delivering the vote of thanks. Uh, I have I have virtually heard you on technology since 2001, probably, when I was in CII. And more recently, of course, in our own uh, FinTech and other related events. And I am the only person in this group who has spent an entire career of 25 years in industry associations. So I have had no dealings with the private sector or with the government, <laughs> which is most, unlike most of you. And I can tell you honestly, this was the best training program that I have been through in public policy in the last one hour. So thank you very much for that. Great learnings. And to get a, a holistic experience of what public policy is, and uh, you know uh, how should we think and architect public policy is my biggest data from this so thank you very much for that and also thanks to our supporters google and uh, with that i would request uh, our president um, uh, ishtiyak to formally close the proceedings thank you very much no thank thank you shubo thank you thank, thank you nandan my last word of the president you know I mean, joe biden has just shown that if you have the patience you'll make it to the office someday so I will, I, I will leave you that with Shubo, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Nandan. We couldn't have asked for anything more. This is, this is phenomenal. And, and I hope.